One of the most fascinating concepts to me, you know, working as a physicist, an astrophysicist, a cosmologist, studying the, the whole entire universe as a single physical object, one of the most captivating thoughts to me is how the universe was different in the past and it will be different in the future. Our entire universe, I mean, think about our cosmos, all there is changes with time. It's a dynamical entity. It's an evolving entity. It has structure. It has growth. It has properties. And all of these things change with time. That's a relatively new concept when it comes to understanding our universe, especially in the Western philosophical, religious, and eventually scientific uh, tradition of understanding the world, of how it's just like... I don't know, it just blows my mind all the time and I want to soak in that moment for just a little bit. I just want to enjoy that thought of how of how our our daily lives change, the world around us changes, our solar system changes, and then our whole entire universe changes. Case in point. Case in point. There was a time in our universe's past when there were no stars. There were no stars at all. There were no sources of fusion energy, no balls of fire, you know, emitting intense amounts of radiation. There was a time before stars. And it's so weird to think about because stars and starlight are such a fundamental part of our understanding of the universe. Like we've had stars for as long as we've had humanity to look at the stars and to use them and to understand astronomy and everything like in even modern day astronomy and cosmology is based on the lives of stars and the positions of stars and the positions of galaxies which are just collections of hundreds of billions of stars there was a time before stars there was a time before the very first star appeared on the scene we call this epoch the dark ages bit of a misnomer. Uh, there was light in this epoch. It just wasn't, you know, starlight. And, you know, kind of warm, kind of glowy ages just doesn't really roll off the tongue like the way dark ages does. And this this age took up the first few hundred million years of the existence of the universe since the Big Bang. It started, it started with an event that we call recombination because that's a different story. Recombination is when the cosmic microwave background was released. So if you go way back in time, let me let me set this up. If you go way back in time, the universe in the past was smaller. You go further back in time, the further back in time you go, the smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller it gets. Eventually, when the universe is about a millionth the size, no, a billionth the size of our current universe, uh, when it was about a billionth the size, about a thousand times smaller than radi in radius, about a billion times smaller in volume, the universe is so small, so hot, so dense, it's a plasma. And as the universe continues to expand from that, from that early state, it expands and it cools. Eventually, it cools off enough that uh, instead of being separated between ions and electrons, it's cool enough that the electrons can latch on to the ions form neutral atoms. And at this point, the universe becomes transparent to light. The light that had all the high intensity radiation that had been bouncing all around that crazy hot plasma soup can finally be released and free stream throughout the universe, completely 100% soaks the universe. We can see it today. Of course, nowadays it's not white, hot, intense radiation. The universe is a lot older. It's a lot colder. That radiation got stretched out all the way down from white hot to the reds to the infrareds, all the way down into the microwave band. Now it's just sitting at a cool 3 Kelvin, 3 degrees above absolute zero. And we call it the cosmic microwave background, the, the leftover light from the early universe. So after that... After that epoch, when the, the, the universe became neutralized and the universe at this age was about 280,000 years old, became neutralized, then there's a long period of time until the first stars appear. Once the first stars appear, which we call the cosmic dawn, 
we start assembling galaxies and clusters of galaxies and we get all the normal familiar sights and structures and sounds of, of the modern day universe. But what was going on in those hundreds of millions of years? What was the universe doing before the first stars came online? And, and that leads to an even more interesting question. How the heck do you build stars? How do you build the first stars? And think about it, the universe at the release of the cosmic microwave background. It's just 280,000 years old. It's just this pretty warm, neutral soup of hydrogen and helium immersed in a bath in high intensity radiation. And that's it. And then you run forward the clock a few hundred million years and now you have stars? Like, how do you build a star? How do you build a star? And here's our picture. Here's our picture of how it goes. At the very early universe, there it wasn't 100% completely uniform. It wasn't totally homogeneous. They're very, very tiny, microscopic, microscopic variations in density. Regions, little pockets are just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more dense than average. We can see this. We can see this in the cosmic microwave background itself. We can see those tiny, tiny density differences. Those lead to tiny temperature differences on that sky map. These we're talking like one part in a hundred thousand density differences. Like you know, there's density, and then this this little region over here is just one one hundred thousandth more dense than the region next to it. Basically nothing but there, right? It's, it's, it, it exists. It is a density difference. Well, after the CMB was released, these density differences still persist. They're still there and they grow with time. Because you if you have a region that's slightly more dense than average, you have a slightly stronger gravitational pull. So you'll start to pull on your neighbors a little bit more. And then they'll glue onto you, which means you'll have an even higher density difference, which means you have an even higher, stronger gravitational pull. So you'll pull on your neighbors even more. You'll become bigger, stronger gravity, stronger pull, more stuff, stronger gravity, stronger pull, more stuff. It's, it's a self-reinforcing cycle that drives differences in densities to go from just a little bit to a lot of bit. In this world, in the early universe, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, so to speak. Any regions of slightly higher density become extremely high density, and any regions of slightly poorer density become completely evacuated out. And eventually, over the course of hundreds of millions of years, you, you find pockets of the universe where the densities keep going up and up and up to a critical point where nuclear fusion can ignite in the cores of those regions, where you're pressing so much stuff in to one tiny little volume that the densities and temperatures reach a certain point that the hydrogen can't help but squeeze together and become helium and release a little bit of energy. Boom, the first star is born. The cosmic dawn arises, dawns, whatever it does. I don't know the word, the verb there. Help me out. When these first stars came online is a little bit under debate because we're not entirely sure. We're not entirely sure. Presumably, it took longer than like 10 years. Definitely, it took less than a billion years because we can look back in time. We can see the universe as it was like about a billion years in. You know, we're getting some hints of that epoch. There's already galaxies. There's already plenty of stars. So we know the first stars had to come before that. But, but when? We think it was sometime within the first few hundred million years of the existence of the universe when the first star was born. We think the stars were born first and then they start to group together to form the galaxies. For say, form proto-galaxies and then full galaxies, then the galaxies themselves assemble into larger structures. That's, that's a story for another day. And these first stars we think were monsters. We think. We think they were gigantic creatures. I'm talking at least 50 times more massive than the sun, maybe even one or 200 times more massive than the sun. Like really, really big fellas, right? Really large objects. And we think that they were big. But again, we're not 100% sure. 
We have no direct observations of this epoch. That's, that's in the next video. I'll talk about that. For this, I'm just talking about our best guess. These stars, we think they were big because at the time, you just had hydrogen and helium. So it was very, very difficult to take a cloud of gas. Remember, to make a star, you need incredibly high densities. You need this cloud of gas to really collapse in on itself. One of the ways a cloud of gas can collapse in on itself is by emitting radiation so that it cools off and it scrunches down. This is how stars are born in the modern day universe. But that relies on a healthy mix of elements where you have plenty of ways to, to give off this radiation. If you just have hydrogen and helium and absolutely nothing else, this process is less efficient. So you can't just start emitting radiation and scrunch yourself down. So you just keep piling more stuff layer upon layer upon layer, this can build a really massive star. Once finally you reach the conditions in the core where nuclear fusion can ignite, you have this tremendous atmosphere, this tremendous shell of material that surrounds you. Now, something we don't fully understand yet is, does this shell like fragment off? So maybe you don't have a single star that's 200 times the mass of the sun. Maybe you just get a bunch of smaller ones that as this process continues, are there, is dark matter involved somehow? Is, is exotic forces involved somehow? We're not exactly sure. We're not clear on that because like I said, we don't have a lot of observations of this epoch. And it's really theory leading the way. We know what the universe looked like in its earliest stages, thanks to the cosmological background. We have that snapshot. We know what the universe looks like today because we have things like galaxy surveys. And we're trying to connect the dots through the formation of the first stars, but we're not quite there yet. Thanks so much for watching. And in part two, I am going to talk about how we detect or how we're attempting to detect those very first stars with observations and see the light of the cosmic dawn for ourselves. Thanks again for watching. Please consider contributing to patreon.com slash PM Center. I greatly appreciate it. It's how I do all my education and outreach initiatives. No one else is paying for it except you. Also feel free to subscribe. Make sure notifications are turned on so that you can see when I go live with Space Radio. Something in my throat and I'm not even going to edit that out. I'm just... I'm done. See you later.